Chapter 10 Sir, I've found something. What is it? An incident report from the original Enterprise under the command of Captain James T. Kirk, filed by First Officer Spock. Reportedly around the time of their encounter with the Mirror Universe counterparts of their landing party, an individual identifying himself as John Smith of mysteriously boarded the Enterprise before being apprehended. What did Kirk do with him? Sorry, sir, the report doesn't seem to elaborate. It just says there was an encounter. Starfleet never pressed for details. What is it with 23rd century captains and their independent streaks? Well, could it be him? It's possible, sir. This Smith isn't recorded as possessing the same equipment, but according to Picard's personal logs, the subject did specify an enterprise, and Kirk's one of the most eventful ones. All right, it's all we have to go on. Prepare an operative. We'll extract the doctor as soon as the timeline permits. I order you to let me go! Mirror Kirk spat, all but flailing in the grip of two burly men as they dragged him down the hall, easily restraining his frenzy struggle. Traitors! Spock! Get these men off me! What is this? Suffice to say, the jig was up. When the Mirror Kirk tried to commandeer the Enterprise and order, the, order that the planet below be bombarded into submission from orbit, Spock had quietly, quickly relieved him of duty. It had been a quick step to security from there. And the captain had been dragged, kicking and screaming and cursing, all the way from the bridge down to the detention level several decks below. The doctor, who had been waiting for over an hour for this little very thing to happen, had made a beeline for the proper section of the ship the moment Spock had announced he was taking command. Now the Time Lord lurked behind the count corner of one of the corridors, watching the little drama unfold. What are you doing, Spock? The alternate McCoy demanded from inside the Enterprise's detention cell, but Kirk was ongoing rant overrode the, the, any hope of response. You traitorous pig! I'll hang you by your Vulcan ears! I'll have you all executed! The man doesn't know how much how to negotiate, the doctor muttered under his breath as he watched him all but toss Kirk into the cell. Is everyone from his universe that bloody loud? I think not, the first officer replied calm, calmly. Your authority on this ship is extremely limited, Captain. The four of you will remain here in the brig in, and in custody until I draw up how to return you to wherever it is that you belong. Has the whole galaxy gone crazy? Obviously, Kirk wasn't even trying to pretend he belonged anymore, and, look, and looking at his wide behavior, the doctor marveled that he lasted so long without being discovered in the first place. What kind of uniform is this? Where's your beard? What's going on? Where's my personal guard? Spock's brow lifted as he replied, quite honestly, I can only answer, I can answer none of your questions at this time. All right, Spock. The fury in Kirk's eyes had faded, replaced with animal cunning. Whatever your game is, I'll play. You want credits? I'll give them to you. You'll be a rich man. A command of your own? I can swing that too. Apparently, some kind of transportation, transposition has taken place, Spock mused. In entirely ignoring the bribed attempt as he focused his attention on the problem in front of him. I find it extremely interesting. As their um, discussion continued, the doctor eased back around the corner, drawing in a deep breath as he considered the medical kit he had borrowed and the tricorder inside. The device was truly ancient by the Enterprise D standards, but from the doctor's perspective, it might as well have been made of wood. Still, it would serve its purpose, to say nothing of being far less noticeable than his sonic screwdriver. Knowing that he would, be able, he would be able to gain access to the prisoners without being searched, the doctor tucked at his screwdriver in his hiding place, tucked it under his waistband of his pants, and considered it for a long moment. He quickly found a new hiding spot for his screwdriver, tucked it in one of the ship's emergency supply cabinets. Given he wasn't anticipating any sort of emergencies in the near future, it seemed as good a place as any to hide it. By the time he had finished this, he peered back around the corner. Spock was gone. The quartet of Mirror Universe counterparts were talking amongst themselves in hushed tones, and a single security guard stood beside the force field, arms crossed over his chest. All right, the doctor muttered. He goes, nothing. Around the corner he went, moving with quick, impatient steps as he bore down on the guard with an intimidating scowl on his face. Who are you? The, doc the guard stammered when he saw the doctor bearing down on him, eyes widening a little. What are you doing here? Who am I? The Time Lord snapped, looking every bit like an overworked bureaucrat as he scurried over to the force field, completely ignoring the scowling universe, mirror universe counterparts as they spun around to glare at him. 
I'm the one of the unlucky sorts trying to keep the medical department from running low, as its head is apparently gone all screwy. What I am doing here? What am I doing here? Nurse Chapel sent me down here to take medical readings. Mr. Spock wanted these people scanned, so I'm here with his express permission. And if you don't mind, I'd like to get this over with post haste so I can get back to tearing my hair, at, uh, tearing out my hair by trying to catalog the dopamine inhibitor vitals and... Curious. I don't recall Nurse Chapel sending someone. I don't recall authorizing Nurse Chapel to send someone. The doctor froze in place, eyes widening just a little. And then, very slowly, he turned in place to find Spock standing behind him, hands behind his back, flanked by a pair of security personnel with lifted phasers. What the hell is going on in here? Kirk bellowed from inside the cell. Mr. Smith, I presume, the first officer greeted, completely ignoring Kirk. If you would please hand Ensign Rain of the tricorder and step into the spare containment cell. Siding, the doctor did it was as he was bitten. If he had his sonic screwdriver, he would have sought to disable the guard's phasers, increasing power to the gravity plating beneath them, immobilizing them. Something. But without it, he didn't have much option. At least, nothing confrontational. Stepping inside the containment cell, an alternate plan began to form, even as the security guards activated the force field. We have been aware of your presence for approximately one hour and ten minutes, Spock said calmly, standing on the other side of the field. Considering the timing of your arrival with that of these alternate versions of the landing party, I calculated an 85% probability that you would, at some point, seek to make contact with these individuals. I must ask, however, for what purpose have you come aboard the Enterprise, and by what means have you achieved this? A security system detected no such intrusion. Oh, that's quite impressive, Doctor replied grudgingly, and a bit embarrassing for me. I don't often feel very predictable. As for your questions, I can't answer them. Spock tilted his head just a little. And why is that? A bit of a smile quirked up at the time Lord's mouth as he replied, No starship may interfere with the normal development of any alien life or society. Spock's mouth twisted, sh shifted into the tiniest of frowns, which for him might as well have been a brazen threat. I'm afraid I do not understand. Yeah, well, there's something I can tell you, the doctor said. 2122. And that is... The precise, that's the precise time you should send this lot to the other, con, uh, in the other containment cell back, Doctor replied. To the same coordinates you beamed the original landing party up from. You're correct, there has been a transposition. Your captain and the rest of the landing party are currently in a far more hostile reality. But in approximately 73 minutes, they will, be a, they will attempt to reverse the effect. You must be prepared for that or their attempt will fail. Spock's eyes narrowed just a little. And how do you know this? The doctor shook his head. I said I can't tell you. Not just yet. But once you've brought your captain back, I'll ask for a chance to speak with you both, alone. Consider my information a sign of good faith. He honestly couldn't tell them too much. For one thing, any information they gained on him would complicate his past self's dealings with the Enterprise D. If they discovered his name, his TARDIS, or even his sonic screwdriver, it wouldn't matter if the Doctor had succeeded in escaping. He would alter his own timeline, and Picard would greet the Doctor's arrival with considerably more suspicion. So he was going to have to walk a, a very fine line. Ensign, Spock finally said to one of the security officers, have Nurse Chapel send a medical t technician team to examine the alternate landing party. See if she can determine what Mr. Smith is looking for. Yes, sir. Should they examine this smith as well? Doctor tensed. If they tried that, he'd have to go for an escape attempt, regardless of the risk. His biology would be just as recognizable to the future Starfleet as his TARDIS. No, Spock finally decided. We will wait for the captain's return before doing anything further with him. With that, the Time Lord gave one last brief glance before striding away, his head down, no doubt calculating the probability that the doctor's advice was genuine. A few hours later, a pair of security guards came to collect the Time Lord, leading him down a series of corridors and down a turbo lift until they reached the Enterprise's main conference room. Stepping inside, the doctor was mildly surprised to see it was occupied only by Spock and Kirk. At one glance was all the Time Lord needed to confirm that this was the real one. No barely repressed scowl, no clenched fists, no full unfocused violence. Well, almost none. Ah, Captain James Tiberius Kirk, the doctor all but beamed. 
I must say, it seems like every second entry I came across in my research had five references to your ship's exploits. It's quite the pleasure to meet the man by whom a hundred uniformed shirts gave their untorn conditions in the service of. <laughs> um, thank you, I think, Kirk replied, a little taken aback that he's united to security. You gentlemen can wait outside. As for you, Mr. Smith, please take a seat. Choosing one of the conference room chairs, the doctor plopped onto a seat with a content sigh, stretching his arms wide and stifling a yawn as he tested the rotational capacities of the chair, spinning it first one way and then another, as he seemed to do with every seat he took. A moment later, he swung his legs on the table, ankles crossed as he hands folded behind his head. Kirk actually looked like he didn't know whether to be amused by the posture, settling for the former as he smiled a little, leaning back on his own chair. So... Kirk began. Mr. Spock tells me that you've quoted from Starfleet General Rule Number One, where when we asked you the reason for your presence, he also told me that you started running around my ship at the time, the same time as this landing party went missing. Paranoid man would think there was a link there. Oh, there is, the doctor replied matter-of-factly. Just probably not in the way you're thinking. Is that so? Kirk frowned a little, eyes narrowing. What do you mean? Well, wow, the doctor leaned back in his seat, hand spreading. You more than likely are thinking that your little trip to the alternate universe was in some way caused by my presence or actions that I undertook, and I can understand the reasons. But in fact, my presence here did not cause your misadventure, but it is in fact because of it. I wanted to gather some information on what happened to you, some clue as to how it happened for independent purposes. But how did you know what it was going to? Kirk paused as it clicked. He began leaning forward in his chair, suddenly very interested. Time travel. Very good, Captain. It would explain his use of General Order Number One, Spock mused. If he is indeed from the future, then his presence runs the risk of contaminating the timeline, as would any information as to his expect exact origins or purpose. Just as the Enterprise avoided altering the development of a pre-warp civilization, perhaps he has a direction, a, di a direction preventing him from directly interfering with us. On the other hand, Kirk continued, doubt still clear in his face, what you're telling us could be just a very clever cover story, a way to avoid making up details. For one, Mr. Smith, isn't telling all this running the risk of changing the future? You told Spock how to get me and my people back, for that matter. I know a thing or two about timelines, the doctor replied, shrugging, and I have a good sense of knowing how to avoid making it too large a dent in them. For one, I knew your Mr. Spock would successfully retrieve you, regardless of my assistance. My contribution simply would have saved him a lot of tedious calculations, though I'm guessing he made them anyway. I know that telling you that I'm from the future in and of itself is safe, as long as I reveal nothing of your personal future. I also know, Captain, that the sacrifices you've made to preserve your past. Something in Kirk's eyes flickered at that moment, his head tilting just a little at his gaze as his gaze hardened. Still... The moment passed, and he drew a breath. So, he said, you know a lot about us. Impressive. But considering the risk, I just can't let you go on your word alone. Well, there is a means to confirm what I'm telling you, the doctor muttered, brow lifting. I've learned quite a bit about Vulcans, you know, a bit of a hobby. If you can't be certain that my word is genuine, then perhaps you should do is read the intent behind them. A mod melt could accomplish this quite handily. Spock's brows lifted in surprise. You are indeed well informed about my race, Mr. Smith. However, it is quite inappropriate to meld with non-Vulcans, and as such I cannot really consider it a valid option. Bollocks! came the do response. The doctor's finger jabbed forward. You've already done it several times, when always with non-humans, always for the purpose of some mission or another, and not even halfway through your five-year runabout. He does have a point, Spock, Kirk said wryly. And if he's telling the truth, turning him over to Starfleet could be more dangerous than letting him go. Meddling with him could give us the answers we need to figure out our next step. Spock considered that. Bra head browed. Am I to assume that this is an order, Captain? No. I won't order you to do it, Captain replied, shaking his head. I know how your people feel about milling with outsiders. And although you've done it before, I've always considered it above and beyond the call of duty. This is something I'm going to force from you. Spock paused for a moment before inclining his head. In which case, I volunteer, Captain. You are correct. There are too many risks to do any less. Wonderful! The doctor's hands clasped together as he beamed. This is turning out swimmingly. 
It was a bit foggy on the mechanics of the whole thing of melding, though. Do we have to butt heads? Because I'll tell you, I've been looking, I've been looking for, for a much less painful method of linking between. I will initiate the meld. Spock replied, finally interrupting what he speculated their guests wouldn't be wasn't going to stop talking anytime soon. Please, simply relax. And be silent. Right, right, of course. Moving with deliberate care, Spock walked around to their captive's chair. Standing behind him, and he reached down with both hands. His fingers quickly found the appropriate blood vessels and nerve points, although the Vulcan noticed that they were placed slightly different than those of most humans. Drawing in a steady breath to prepare himself, Spock's eyes closed as he began to concentrate, in intoning each word. My mind to your mind, my thoughts to your thoughts. The moment the connection was made, Spock was lost. This man's mind was ancient, ancient, labyrinthian, and with a discipline that made a mockery of centuries of Vulcan self-control. Beneath the bumbling, beaming, rambling exterior of this strange man, this mind was sharp as a blade and unyielding as a mountain. Although Spock was the one who had initiated the meld, he suddenly felt as if he was being pulled along it, dragged deeper and deeper into the flashing lights and swirling colors. Countless worlds flickered past his mind, more than the Enterprise had ever witnessed, more than any ship in the Starfleet had ever been so much drawn near to. Species so strange and wonderful and terrifying. Civilizations whose history could have swallowed that, could have swallowed that of every race the Federation had encountered ten times over. Even after he had had the information he needed, even after he had confirmed beyond a shadow of a doubt that this man had spoken the truth, Spock could not disengage. But he should have. Because with every moment that passed, every instant Spock did not pull away, bits of his own mind were being chipped away, lost in the nexus of thought and emotion. At that moment, the Vulcan was more vulnerable than he had ever been. Open and exposed through the meld, Spock could become little more than clay to be molded into whatever shape the doctor chose. The stranger could have implanted a thought, any thought, into the sign officer's mind, or simply crushed his very being like an insect underfoot. But he did none of these things. And then, mercifully, there was a withdrawal, not by Spock, but by this behemoth of a mind who pulled away with all the care of a found father gathered up all the fragments of the Vulcan's tattered psyche and knitted them back together. With practice skill, the doctor's mind finally untangled itself from the tendrils of Spock's tendrils that even then reached out in supplication, not wanting to be removed from all that knowledge, all that experience, all that time. And then with thunder and ice, reality came crashing back down. Contact broke abruptly as Spock staggered back, hands lifting reflectively to, to clutch his head, sweat beating across his skin from the brief, violent telepathic contact. Kirk's hand snapped at him at, to, red, to steady him, but the Vulcan waved him off, drawing on his inner reserves and a slow breath to regain his inner and outer equilibrium. The doctor, for his part, remained seated, head tilted, unruffled, and clean none the worse for wear. Clearly, the exchange had been a great deal less uncomfortable for him than it had been the, the time he had tried to do with a one extremely untelepathic human. Spock's dark eyes flickered back at the Time Lord as he finally uttered the only word that really suited the experience. Fascinating. Thank you, the doctor replied. Spock was silent for a moment as he considered what he had seen, heard, and felt. Already much of it was fading, becoming less distinct, less specific, but enough detail remained for him to know that the danger that he had been and the consideration that this man had shown. It surprised him, to say the least, that someone held captive and facing possible imprisonment wouldn't have used every available weapon. Tilting his head, he moved a few more steps away from the prisoner, and when Kirk naturally followed, the Vulcan lowered his voice to a near murmur. He could have supplicated my, supplanted my will, Captain. Spock noted, and in doing so, compelled me to convince you to release him. My word would have undoubtedly been sufficient enough to convince you. And yet, he chose instead to help me preserve my sense of self. He did not take advantage of my vulnerability. You have seen my mind, the doctor called out from across the room, having heard every word. You know why I didn't. Why I wouldn't. Indeed, 
Spock's brow lifted as he turned his attention back to Kurt, the voice returning to normal volume. Captain, I am aware that he is an intruder. However, knowing what I do now, I can see no logical reason for keeping him in our brig. And of course, the risk to the timeline would be considerable. Kirk, for his part, returned to the conference table, perching at the edge instead of taking a seat. Hands crossed over his chest, he mulled over the matter for a moment, glancing from the doctor to Spock and then back again. His lips pursed a little in thought, and then he finally hopped back to his feet, decision made. I don't know what you are, Kirk began, hand spreading. And my duty as a Starfleet captain wouldn't let me keep this completely a secret. I can't order my bridge crew to pretend they didn't see you, or my security staff to deny ever keeping you in custody. I certainly won't turn them against Starfleet command in that way. And Mr. Spock seems to like you well enough, and that sort of commendation doesn't come often easily from him. That's enough for me. So if you promise to leave quietly, I'll make sure our report to Starfleet isn't too... specific. Really? The doctor's brow raised a little, mimicking Spock's typical gesture. I'm surprised you'd get away with that. It would not be the first time the logs have been selectively entered, Spock replied, sounding almost wry. There will be questions, Kirk admitted. We're a long way from Starfleet headquarters. Out here you found that the starship's captains have the authority to make their own decisions, and we defend them. Well, I'll leave it to your expertise, the doctor replied agreeably, then hesitated. There is a little, however, one more thing I'd like to ask. We're setting you free, and you're going to ask for more? Kirk actually grinned at that. I'm starting to like you myself. As I said, the doctor replied, I came in for information related on the transporter accident that left you stranded in the al that alternate reality. The data could prove quite useful, and I'd most be grateful if I could take it with me when I departed. Kirk hesitated and then glanced over at his first officer. Mr. Spock? The information is quite harmless, Captain, Spock replied. All right, Kirk nodded to himself, then smiled at the doctor. Promise not to make my day even more eventful, and Mr. Spock will set you up with all you need. Less than ten minutes later, the doctor had returned to the cargo bay, having retrieved a sonic screwdriver from its hiding place. He also acquired a set of data chips from Spock containing all the information that he'd been looking for, and even some files on other magnetic storms that the Federation starships had encountered, for comparative purposes. Ah, good day, he murmured, drawing deep breath and smiling. Very good day. Now, where did I park? He had sort of forgotten how bloody huge the cargo bay was, and although he had a most excellent memory at finding things, the dim lighting wasn't helping. Still, that he didn't have to deal with an impending capture, he was more than happy to wander about a bit until he found it, and as he worked his way through the rows and rows of supply crates, he began to whistle a jaunty tune. An old earth song about riding a donkey legitimately writing, not the less savory interpretations. And then came the next snag in his plan. Hold it right there! Before the doctor could so much even as he's even twitch, a man stepped from the shadows. Dressed in a red tunic of the security guard, he leveled one of those old-style phasers in the Time Lord's direction. This, this cargo bay is off-limits to all but supply technicians. What are you doing down here? I think there's been some misunderstanding, the doctor replied slowly being very certain not to make any sudden movements. He wasn't looking to end his day with getting stunned. I'm down here with the permission of your captain and Mr. Spock, no less. Legitimately this time, just use your little flip thingy and give him a call. He'd be happy to vouch for me. Oh, chums we are. Academy buddies grew up together, shared blankets when we were tots, stole every each other's toys. Wait, do Vulcans even have toys? So, the man's eyes re and man replied, eyes narrowing. You're a friend of the commander's. I just said that, didn't I? The doctor replied haughtily. And don't think I won't report you. Prove it, the man replied, tossing something small at the Time Lord with a flick of his wrist. Reflexively, the doctor caught it and opened his hand curiously. A small cylindrical beacon with a flashing light at the tip rested in his palms. It took him all but two seconds and the sight of the grin on the human's face when he realized this was probably what it was for. Oh, damn. He wanted nothing more than to drop the device, if not throw it away with all the force he could muster, but it was too late. He could already feel a slight tingle in his chest, and a low hum filled the air. As the feeling of crawling ants spread across the doctor's body, he rapidly disintegrated, mouth twisted into a scowl, muttering even as he faded away into a shimmering light of a transporter energy. I can't believe I fell for that! 
When the transporter beam faded, the doctor found himself facing no less than four security personnel, all dressed in unfamiliar uniforms, equally unfamiliar phasers pointed in the Time Lord's direction. Between them, a bustling control room, complete with blinking lights, touch controls, considerably more flashy than those in the ship he had just left. Wonderful, the doctor said wryly, nonetheless lifting his hand slowly. Humans with weapons, that's a novelty. Even as he spoke, his eyes flitted back and forth, considering his surroundings. This place was considerably more advanced than the original Enterprise. In fact, given it didn't match any Federation designs he recalled, the doctor suspected even Picard's ship would be considered an antique by comparison. He considered the possibility that there was another ship out there, perhaps hiding with stealth technology, but if that were the case, he couldn't imagine why they'd need to tag him to bring him aboard. How many other two-hearted life forms could there have been aboard the Enterprise? Licking his lips, he considered the pad he was standing on. Like a transporter in design, of course, but something about it tugged at him. A quick glance at the room and the displays of various screams confirmed it. Ah, temporal transporter, he announced to one of his guards beside him, fingers crossed a little as he peered about the bridge, weight shifting on his heels and toes, and back again. What a dull way to get around, to say nothing of dangers. How many times did you, did you get away with it before using that, before the brain starts to go all knotted? Captain, one of the personnel said, not trying not to look annoyed at the chattering guests, failing rather abysmally at that. Our guest has arrived. One of the crewmen, who was seated in a broad, with a broad console halfway across the room, he climbed to his feet, approaching the group with his hands folded behind his back. He was of average height in a slim build, surprisingly young in appearance, with dark hair and a surprisingly friendly demeanor given his circumstances. Doctor, the man said quietly, smiling. I'm, Car I'm Captain Charles Duquesne. Welcome aboard the Relativity.